So the reason I moved here mainly is because when we were in Vancouver, we had kids and it was like, the traffic is just crazy. Cause I would yeah. go from Maple Ridge to North Vancouver back and forth two to four hours a day. Oh my God. And then after having kids, it was like, now we have to sit into lineups for the schools. And to me, I just, I just didn't want to be a part of, of no. all this extra work. What a way to live. Yeah. And I really wanted my kids to grow up with the lifestyle I had. Yeah. And this city is very much like the lifestyle I had. Hello, I'm John Blink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia. And for all those people watching us from around the world, where is Prince George? We know where British Columbia is, but where is Prince George? Okay, let me describe it. Uh, we got, everybody knows where Vancouver is. We are 500 miles north of Vancouver or 800 kilometers for my friends in Europe. And that puts us physically in the center of British Columbia, a large, big area. And a lot of the province of British Columbia is timber and uh, not quite as much as we used to have, but still there is a lot of timber. And we have a lot of people that work in the forest industry and then other people are working in construction and are artists with lumber and timber and do all kinds of things. Today, we have somebody like that. And his name is Will Clark. Will, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Um, first off, I'd like to say it's very humbling to be here, and and thank you for that. Yeah. Well, th thank you for, for being here. You know, because uh, now you are living here in northern British Columbia. I am. And in Prince George, in mm -hmm. fact, how long have you been in Prince George? I moved up to Prince George um, during COVID. Um, it was. It was during COVID we moved up here from Vancouver, yeah. Oh, from Vancouver. Eh? So that would have been in 2019, 2020. 2020, yeah. yeah 2021, yeah. maybe. Yeah, even 2021, maybe. Mm -hmm. So now the other part about you is you are into woodworking of all kinds of different descriptions, and you are also, you have a company called Urban. Urban Beaver Construction, yeah. Construction, and that does construction of not just homes, but it does construction renovations and all kinds of things like that yeah we do um, kitchens bathrooms um, home additions and uh, woodworking is more of just like a um, like a hobby like, yeah yeah it's yeah. kind of a pastime hobby yeah yeah so I'm gonna show my guest something that you brought for me and this weighs a ton now yeah. this again <laughs> is something that Bill did mm -hmm. in his shop and it has all the different species here. C can you point out to us what is all there, Will? Yeah, so we Fortin's have um, red oak, walnut, there is... All local, right? It's, uh, no, not really all local at all, no. No, okay. There's some hemlock. Some of this came out of flooring from, uh, from renovation, previous renovations I did. So oh. e even like this hickory here came out of a renovation downtown from an older home. And Oh my God, hickory yeah. here? Yep. It's on the island, I know that, but... Yeah, yeah. no, it, it came out of a renovation, so it was like, um, it was there in their floor, but... A lot of it comes from BC, though? Yeah, um, no, n I don't think most of this would have come from British Columbia at all. So you know? what is this species here? This one here is walnut. Walnut, okay. Yep, walnut, um, we've got hickory, maple, and cherry, and uh, oak, yeah. That's about it. Amazing, much. you know, and again, showing uh, to all our guests, uh, and it's heavy. It's pretty heavy, yeah. Oh, absolutely. my God. And thank you very much. <laughs> no, I'm absolutely. I'm going to be very thank proud you. of it. Yeah. You know, so, so you do a lot of, not necessarily building houses, but doing renovations in specialty work? Yeah, for sure. Like, um, I really like, I, I focus on renovations, but it's like, I always... Uh, I always like the challenge of just, if someone says, can you do this? It's hard for me to say that's, no. That's already a challenge. Right? It, I like the challenge, you know, it's, right. um, yeah. So. And, and so I looked at your resume and you, you have uh, uh, worked in, where did you get your training? I did primarily most of my, my schooling came from British, uh, BCIT. BCIT. So I did British year, Columbia Institute of yeah, Technology. Yeah, I did year two, three, and four in, in BCIT. And uh, 
Year one, I did back east in Newfoundland, actually. Oh, my goodness. Are yeah. you originally from there, Newfoundland? I am originally from Newfoundland, yeah, corner wow. of Newfoundland. Yeah, and that's an absolute beautiful province as well, right? It's very beautiful. It yeah. is, yes. And so what brought you to doing that kind of a training? Did your family have well, a background? Well, I grew up with my dad being a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none okay. kind of deal, and... Yeah. Uh, he kind of taught me the, you know, the values of hard work. And um, so it, it kind of forced me into the trades unknowingly. And, and it kind of just, I just gravitated toward it, you know. Right. And um, yeah, I ended up picking it as a career because of that, I think. Right. And then from there on end, you got your schooling. BC, British Columbia Institute of Technology is certainly one of the highest level of it's a great school it really training is. and it's it big is. right it's, it's a big school yeah it's something like forty thousand students yep yeah huge probably. huge amount of it. i did a presentation there and and all i see around me is buildings and said where, where do i go you know so uh, mm -hmm. it shoots yep year two three and four i did there yeah and and so that then qualified you for being a what well, you take your Red Seal Carbon Tree certificate right. after that, and um, real. I was a union guy for a long time, so I worked um, United Brotherhood of Carpenters. Um, right. And then I got into the movies, so IATSE eight nine one building film sets and stuff. And oh, it, uh, so you're it, in the movies. So what you then did is uh, your trade as it related to the movies. A part of it. I mean. I was always chasing that, uh, the different thing, you know what right. I mean? Like I would always do renos and then I would jump out of renovations and I would get into the union was always there, you know, but it's doing coffer dams down in North Vancouver to right. the evergreen sky train station, um, big jobs mostly. So a lot of these jobs that you did were in a union required environment. So that's but you had to be a member of the unions yes. in order for you to qualify. And that then for the purpose, for the people that hired you, maybe government or some organization, they knew that they had somebody that was qualified to do those yeah, kind of jobs. Yeah, for sure. Like, like going through the union when you, uh, when you get your education, you get ranked in there, you get seniority. Um, and then, yeah, you get put on jobs accordingly. And, and, and with the union, it's not always like always a job there. So it's like every time there wasn't, we'd, we'd I'd probably go back to like residential a lot. Right. Um, but I was definitely bouncing back and forth quite a bit. So would you qualify yourself as kind of an entrepreneur in a way? Or I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur um, at heart. Like, um, you know, always I always have been a bit of an entrepreneur at heart for sure. Yeah. yeah. So was your dad uh, involved in this kind of a thing in he was, Newfoundland? Yeah. He, he always had his... It's pretty much like that in Newfoundland, it seems. Yeah. It's, you know, you, you... Yeah, for sure. Reminds me of Holland in a way, because, because like for myself, I'm into lumber. My dad was in lumber. My grandfather was in lumber. So mm -hmm. likely I'd be in lumber, but I loved it. So, you know, that's right from an yeah, early age. Sure. I would know... Mm -hmm. I worked in a furniture factory. Yeah. And then uh, was trained uh, in the college as uh, becoming a furniture maker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like when we were younger, um, you know, it, you, you become mechanically inclined when you have to fix everything that breaks or you exactly. just don't have it. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. It, it was uh, I, ultimately it all pushed me towards trades in the end, for sure. Yeah. And then <clears throat> but I found is that uh, like for myself being in lumber starting here, I came here about 60 years ago from Holland mm -hmm. uh, with nothing. I had, uh, couldn't speak language, didn't know a soul, didn't have a job. And uh, I had, uh, when I came out of the bus here, I had $25.47 mm -hmm. and uh, started as cleanup man, lumber pilot, and then gradually worked my way up. Mm -hmm. yeah. But already, I was not exactly a success story in school. I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. Right. I said, oh my God, who have, you know anybody who failed grade three? Really? You yeah, know? Right. So, and then he said, what are we going to do with this guy? Send him to the mentally challenged school. No, my parents said, no, I'm not going to do that. So they then thought, 
maybe what they should do with me is teach me a trade. Mm -hmm. So when my dad had a con connection with a fellow that had a furniture factory, and uh, I always remember the schools came out on Friday, and for the summer holiday, and it was the third time that I had failed grade seven. And, and all the kids then got about three or four weeks off from school. So my dad had a friend that had a store, closing store, and uh, on Friday I came out of school, again the same, I failed. So this was the end of that particular path. Right. He took me to the uh, furniture store and uh, <clears throat> on a Sunday, actually, and uh, I had to get, uh, he found me a job at the furniture factory. I had to get three sets of cover coveralls. Mm -hmm. But I was only 13, I was fairly small for my age. So they didn't even have coveralls. So I, they found some that I had to roll them up about three or four <laughs> times. The crotch was hanging about here by my knees. That's modern now, but it mm -hmm. wasn't then. Yeah. Anyway, so that was me going to become a furniture maker. Right. I personally At 13. <laughs> right. 13, yeah. I, I think I was pretty young. Like I remember doing roofing with my dad when I was like 15 years old. And um, yeah, we were roofing at 15 and and then I remember probably about 18 I moved to Vancouver and that's where I ended up going to Vancouver and I ended up getting a job ironically with a guy being an electrician apprentice for the oh first my. little bit. And so okay. I did the schooling and then I went and did electrical for probably nine months. Okay. And it just wasn't as um, gratifying as building something. To me, right. it wasn't. So I, I quickly jumped back into the trade and I was Good doing, experience though. It was great, like it helped me, you know, I have a, I have a very basic knowledge of electrical right now because yeah. of that eight months. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, I went into back framing, um, you know, multi-unit buildings at the time, which was another great experience. Yeah. Um, so you work for a number of different companies then. I have, I've actually jumped around quite a bit. Um, and then and, when, and did, when did you get involved with the unions then? When you tried to get on a project that I've required? I've almost always been a part of the unions. Right. And I built a pretty good relationship with them all. And, right. And um, yeah, so it was like, it was, it was basically like, they would phone and if I was interested, I would kind of go kind of deal. Um, it wasn't always I would just go because yeah. I always had jobs with residential companies that I worked for. And right. Yeah. But you were obviously good. Uh, you know, the, the key for me is always, uh, I say it in this actually, I have my sign here of uh, for 2547. That's how much I in my pocket when I came right. to George. But the other part that's <laughs> even more important underneath it, it says mm -hmm. attitude, passion, work ethic. That's me. I've always been like that. Absolutely. So I, I always avoid negative uh, passion. Uh, whatever I do, I give it 150%. So do you. Mm -hmm. And then work ethic. I work harder than anybody. For sure. And even at 83, I'm still uh, nearly 84. I still get up at 530 and I always think I'm late. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I had no safety net when I moved to British Columbia. So. Right. I had no choice but to uh, but to get good at what I was doing and right. make a living doing it. Right. So, but the advantage, likely, Bill, that you had, I believe, no different with me. At a very young age, I got involved in the factory. I got used to working with my hands, and I learned fairly quickly mm -hmm. how things worked, and that gave me an experience that I would have never gotten in school or anything else, and even still today. Absolutely. But the benefit of starting out so young, working with my hands and starting from yep. the ground up is still an experience that is invaluable to me. Absolutely. Even today when I have a number of different companies. Like I still believe that, you know, like some of the best carpenters I've met over the years and I've worked with some of the best, I think. Yeah. Um, some of the best ones I've worked with don't, never been to school. Exactly. And, and you know, and, and like vice versa, some of the ones who've been to school, well, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's there, right? Like, yeah. The same in the forest industry, like, uh, you know, the, uh, some of the old timers are gone more so all the time. Mm -hmm. The thing that it, the biggest challenge that is for me and the different companies that I have uh, in the lumber side and the warehousing that we are doing or uh, uh, building both residential, industrial mm -hmm. and commercial, uh, the, the biggest challenge by far is from the bottom up all the way to the top ranks is finding the trades 
of people that have the skill sets of, of the knowledge that I require in my companies. Absolutely. And it, it's a growing problem trying to find yeah. the, uh, the people to fit your company nowadays, for sure. And it will become a deterrent. I said that when I got involved with the college and I'd be honored to have my name on the building there, the Trades and Technology Center. But when I did that, it must have been about 25, 30 years ago when I made that donation, is that I said then it's not access to uh, resources. It will not be access to uh, infrastructure, roads, mm -hmm. air, Ro uh, uh, trains or rail or it will not be uh, access to capital mm -hmm. or management but it will the, the deterrent will be access to a skilled workforce yes that was the case then hence the trades and technology center but it's far too small compared it's good but it's small to where we need to be yes and that's what i already said then that uh, you know that with the amazing resources that we have available not just lumber but all across the board mm -hmm. and the upper half of the province that's where we are and i'd say a lot of times to my friends uh down south is that uh you know probably 80 percent of the gdp the gross domestic product of the province yes. is generated in northern bc and i always kind of look behind me looking south and say don't you forget it mm -hmm. but we're still not spending enough capital here on creating jobs uh, and 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 schools that will teach or colleges that will ski still or the likes of bcit and uh, yeah and i say we need here and, and we already committed a million dollars towards the yeah, project. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. Is, is to say, a, a school of excellence, I call it, to make mm -hmm. sure it doesn't get labeled with a mark. But even the college has benefited from people like ourselves and others being involved in the college. It's very, very good. Serves Northern BC, not only Prince George, is doing a good job, but it needs further growth. University of British Columbia, another mm -hmm. amazing, uh, project. I was quite involved in it when we started that. We wanted a freestanding university, not a subsidiary of another yes. one, but freestanding. We got that and a lot of people were involved in it. Uh, and now we need, uh, I believe, a center of excellence that uh, deal with the issues of uh, skill sets that we need to attract mm. capital. Yes. And, and it is not all that long ago, but a year, year and a half ago, I guess, that, uh, or maybe even shorter than that, where industry got involved and made a donation to funding a new $250 million project at BCIT. And, and I love BCIT, it does a great job, but it's already a monster. It is. 40,000 people. I said, you know, what we should be doing is spending capital here like that. And, and start Agreed. that yep. uh, center of excellence. And I've been a promoter of that for the last 10 years. And I speak about it whenever the opportunity presents itself. And obviously already when I got involved with the college. And uh, that will be the deterrent mm -hmm. for attracting capital. And, and even more so now, uh, Bill, as you already know from your profession, is that the generation is getting older and older again, and if I look at sawmills or, or pulp mills and all the other things, uh, that a lot of those skill sets are retiring in the next Absolutely. five, ten years, and we don't have new people to come in yep. and replace them. You know, I know when I was younger, there was a lot more workers, apprentices, than there was work. So when you worked, you you became the best because there's someone else waiting for your job a exactly. lot of the times. Yeah. And, um, you know, nowadays as like an, an, as an entrepreneur, business owner, I would love to grow. The phone rings constantly, but yeah. like finding employees is not just a problem I'm having. I see ads from other great companies in town, including us and they, and their ads are always there. Always. We yeah. always are looking for people all the way from just count common laborers to yeah. senior executives. Yeah. 
and it has been the biggest challenge in our company. Yeah. We employ, with all things are normal, around 400 people mm -hmm. in different companies. And, uh, you know, and we want to grow and expand, but we're always Absolutely. very, very aware of the lack of uh, the skill sets. Mm -hmm. And it's almost sad because, you know, these homeowners, they, they want things done. They want their places done. And, you know, I'm already pretty well booked for almost this year almost. And, yeah. like, you know, you can't answer everybody's phone call and make, you know. No. Yeah, uh, yeah because the thing that you always have to be aware of is saying, well, where do you find the skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you don't have the employees, then it will be a challenge. So... Now, you look to me like you're pretty fit. Are you into <laughs> fitness? I, I have recently started to do um, calisthenics. What I, is calisthenics? I, um, calisthenics is basically using your own body weight. So like chin-ups, push-ups, um, planches. I can't do planches. I try. Um, <laughs> but things like that. It's basically using your own body weight instead okay. of like free weights. And, and so you do that at home or...? I'm learning it, and I do it all at home. Yeah, so. So your you, your wife is she involved in that as well, or? No, she's she's not. No, but she's fully supportive of it. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I've started calisthenics, and I have recently changed my whole diet over to a whole foods diet. So only meat and vegetables. That's it. So. What motivated you? Is, did something happen that, the reason that I no. say that, because that's what happened to me, something triggered it and all of a sudden I said, mm, I better start smartening up here. I think for me it was just, you know, I, I was always fit as a young man. And then I had kids and then five years of kids, two kids, it kind of grown on me a little, you know, and um, I just wanted to be a good inspiration to my kids more than How anything. old are your kids? They are five and two. And they are boys, girls? Two girls. Two girls. What are their names? Caitlin and Catherine. Caitlin and Catherine. Yeah. Okay. I always like to know uh, yeah. and your wife, uh, her name? My name, my, uh, Cyril. My wife's name is Cyril. Okay. So, so to come back, so what triggered you to... to it, your kids for one, obviously, but to change your diet and then to go become more active uh, physically. Well, I'm not getting any younger. And well, you look to me, you're pretty young. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm almost 40, right? So like, for me, it was, you know, like for, for years, I was like, I'm going to start. And then I never did. And then I guess um, that makes you the same as everybody else. Yeah, because for sure. including me. So I guess I just got to the point where I just hyper fixated on it and totally just went to one extreme to the other. Like I cleared That's out good. my cabinets and I just did it. That's good. But it was a learning curve, how to eat, um, how to do the calisthenics properly. Um, but yeah. Now you already know, I've already shown you this, yes, right? Yes, I see that. This is, uh, you know, the, I've done three books. Have you seen my books? I have, yeah, yeah. You have them? I have not read them. I have, I have seen them, yes. You, have you got copies of them? I do not have copies. Okay, I so should, I'll sign some for you today. That's and give amazing. To you, all you. three of them. The one is against all odds. Mm -hmm. And that's not about how successful John is, just the opposite, actually. Going through all the ups and downs and it all the way. sounds like me. All these books sound like me, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so th this book is uh, about me, 80 years of my life, 20 years to think about writing a book, and then it took me two years to write it. And mm -hmm. so 80 years of living and going through all the ups and downs, I will get you a copy of that That's one. That's amazing, thank you. And then the other thing that I have is, uh, uh, in 1997, in January of 1997, I walked into a store here and I picked up a book and, and I still don't know why. It's, uh, Books on Fourth are, are mm -hmm. books and, and company. Yes. Books and and company, yeah. I picked it up and there was a book driven to distraction. And and I I don't know why I picked it up. I opened the book and it was about ADHD. Mm -hmm. Now I am and when I saw it and I looked at it and say, Oh my god, that's me. And and I was ashamed of it at first. So I wrote in Dutch in the book. Now I finally know who I am. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then the more I found out about it is the frequency of occurrence is very 
first I thought about 8%, as they said, according to Google. Yep. And the more I found out about it, it's more closer to 20%, in right. my opinion. And, uh, and then I felt I had to write about it. So I wrote this book about it, ADHD Unlocked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's not only, it's about being easily distracted and another number of things yes. that are unique to people with ADHD. The book is not only to people that have learning difficulty or the conventional learning uh, classes and what is being taught is that, but also people that are affected by trauma for some other reason or slow learners. And mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote a book about it. And uh, now the interesting part about it is that about a couple of weeks ago, three months ago, a month ago, is the book that I picked up then written by Dr. Halliwell. I opened it and, uh, you know, and, and then saw ADHD. He uh, wrote the book in 1993. Mm -hmm. I picked it up in 1997 here. I still had the book. I wrote it in Dutch. Now I finally know <laughs> who I am. And, and I had him on my podcast number. I don't know if you saw that one, 203. I don't think so. No, that was a good one because... Uh, you know, while I was talking to him about it and saying that I believe that probably 20% of the population have ADHD, he said, no, John, it's probably closer to 25%. Right. The other thing that I said, I believe from my experience, is that probably 50% of the successful, and the operative is successful, entrepreneurs and CEOs, are probably ADHD, he said, no, John, probably 75%. Mm -hmm. And so, so the issue around ADHD and slow learning uh, and other issues and, and how to change that system that is more uh, accepting of different learning styles yes. is becoming more and more popular. And, and we call it uh, 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 micro certificates you know, where you right. focus on a certain sk skill set and the other things are extras, but focus first on the skill sets yes. that you want to teach somebody and then kind of go forward from there. Yeah, like as you know, I had, I have ADHD um, and I was, I remember being in school and like I could never really focus on school as much. And uh, so like I would always look for things to like keep my mind occupied, like I guess boost my dopamine levels, like drawing pictures, which is funny because it is related I, to I carpentry so. in a way, like I the whole so. artistic part of it, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So like, um, yeah, like ADHD has definitely been, and, and I think that has something to do with me, like going to different jobs and always looking for that dopamine spike of like learning something new and, yeah. and, and getting there and learning it and then like finding something else that I do the keeps same. my attention at, at yeah. yeah. Being a speaker, being a writer of books right. and doing all the for things sure. that I do. Absolutely. I call it a superpower. Yes. And, and so that the more I speak about, especially to young people now that, uh, that look at it as a negative, I don't, you know, I say it has the potential of being a superpower. Once Absolutely, you understand yeah. it, and then make it work for you. And mm -hmm. that's what I did in my case. And, uh, yep. and so I'm fairly vocal about it. So the other thing that I find is a lot of times that uh, with my books is that I find a lot of, when I do presentations to young people, I usually ask them, what do you want to do for a career? And say, well, I don't know. You know, I said, what you should do is respectfully talk to people that already are in the workplace. You want to be a truck driver, talk to truckers. You want to be a carpenter, talk to carpenters or mm -hmm. contractors. Or you want to be a doctor, talk yes. to docs. A lot of people will talk to you and give you an opinion about what they do and why they do it mm -hmm. and how, you know, those kind of things. And it develops kind of interest in, or you want to be an entrepreneur or whatever, business person, you know, they, they will all talk to you. So I felt I had to write a book about that. and. Uh, you know, so finding your passion, living, living your dream, your dream yeah. so important. I'm going to give you a copy of that. That's today. amazing. Thank you, you know, and then the the last one, talking to you and your fitness. This is the first time I've seen this one. Yeah, you haven't seen that before. I'll just again show it to uh, my people. This one is 
We are pretty much now to the point it will come out probably in July, mm -hmm. August at the latest. Uh, we've just gone through the second draft that's now from here on in. This is a process that, uh, that develops and then it goes to the printers and then we print it. So it should be out then. But mm -hmm. the whole idea is living young, dying old. And the point of it is that uh, obviously fitness and how do you get there. But more importantly is that I'm 83, becoming 84, hopefully in November the 1st, is that that's just a number. And, Absolutely. And, yeah. But it's more important, though, is uh, being fit and quality of life mm -hmm. is what's important. I know so many people, they are still... Quality of life is important. That's what it is about. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially in the last decade of somebody's life, that they go through a very, very difficult time. And the, what I always say is, and you probably feel the same, your body is extremely forgiving, but you can only abuse it for so long. Absolutely. And then from there and then something is going to happen, mm -hmm. which you cannot fix. Yeah. But the body wants to be healthy. It will try everything possible to mm -hmm. keep you healthy. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so what happened with me, as you indicated that you got that, sense of saying I have to change you know my diet as well as becoming physically more the active. diet's the most important part yeah there's no question about it so what I did is what happened with me is that was in 2008 I got a case of diverticulitis I don't know if you know what it is is where you have uh, you know if if you got pain in your tummy area and you got it on your right side then right. it likely is appendicitis or something Mm -hmm. If it is on the left side, it could well be diver uh, mm -hmm. ticulitis and, uh, you know, it is your colon and, and, you, and it's not uncommon. And then if you go to a dog, they would say, okay, clean up your diet a bit, do mm -hmm. more greens and less stuff that may get hung up in your area yeah. there. But in my case, it ruptured. Hmm. And then you have maybe 48 hours in which the toxins go through your system and start attacking the healthy systems and it could kill you. And uh, so uh, I came that close, you know, and, right. and so then I knew I'm going to have to do something. Up to that point, I was doing the same as a lot of other people do is that uh, at the end of the year, uh, we all make the commitment. We're going to do this, that, 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 and I'm going to buy a membership to the gym. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the gym. And you go to the gym for two weeks and then you find a hundred reasons that you can't go anymore. And the next year, hopefully you do the same. That's what sure. I used to do. And, and, but then I knew I had to do something different in earnest. And that was taking a very close look at my diet. And my wife is vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but I was not doing, I did some but not as careful as I should. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and started looking at that part and became more or less a vegan. I call it 80-20. For sure. And, uh, and then I got a trainer uh, and go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I did that initially for about six or seven years. And then somebody came up to us and said, have you ever thought about competing? I said, well, me? You know, mm -hmm. and then I said, well, why not? It's a challenge, right? Yep. And and I'm going to do that. So the I challenge, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I started competing, and I came in second bodybuilding, third in physique, brought Good me to you. the provincials, came in the same, then brought me to mm -hmm. the nationals and the Arnolds, and then obviously COVID happened, and now again I'm training for the Arnolds in 2025, That's and I'm amazing. 85. Wicked. Makes me the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America. That's awesome. So and and so. But it's fun, for one. But the other part, the diet, as you already indicated, is one of the most important parts mm -hmm. of it. So no, for sure. I'm very, very careful about diet, uh, primarily uh, plant-based. Uh, right. You know, the, I try to stay away from processed foods. Me too. Uh, I'm the, 100 the percent away from it the, now. Yep. So if I go to a grocery store, I stay on the outside, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and and. I started on December 27th, and I am down oh. 23 pounds. Wow! In since since then, yeah, 23 pounds. Wow! And uh, I all I did was change diet and and calisthenics. Yeah. Yeah, and and so 
and it's sorry it, it's great because like unintentionally my kids and my wife are now eating way healthier and and it by association exactly yeah, yeah. because they see it is good for you yeah. and it's pretty much it's the only thing in the fridge now <laughs> yeah so, like, and that and we do the same actually <laughs> yeah before i didn't but now uh, my wife, myself, uh, you know, the uh, she's a bit more strict than me, but I still do. And it, and we have a place in North Sandwich actually. So every Friday tomorrow mm -hmm. at uh, one o'clock, I fly down to North Sandwich, stay there till Monday morning, eleven, then fly back to Prince George Day right. for the week. And uh, and I do all the shopping. Mm -hmm. So she trusts me enough. She's very particular, but she trusts me. That I always do that uh, automatically on Saturday or on Sunday. I do the shopping for her for the week for all the food. Yeah. But I like it, and then uh, I'm pretty intensely training again now mm -hmm. uh, with the trainer, and that works for me. That's great. Mm -hmm. So, what is the objective in terms of from? If you you look to me, you're like in good shape. You want to lose more weight. There's really no objective. I, yeah. I just want to eat better, be healthier. Being healthy. You know, and just being healthy in general, really. Um, yeah. That's it's basically all it is for me. And, and for my kids to eat better, too. Because it's so easy to just go to the grocery and buy these easy things. And, and ultimately, the learning process and of... And the sweets, yeah. And um, I've gotten used to eating this way and, and, and preparing this way so it's yeah. um it, it's become a lifestyle now and yeah just in the short amount of time actually but yeah so so you started when December December 27th I believe oh just before Christmas mm -hmm. or just after Christmas so you've done that January February March yeah. April 196 pounds and I'm now 177 I believe so well wow, that's mainly from food really unbelievable it is unreal it really is yeah so that again for the guests watching they say it cannot be done yes it is oh it can it, be done for yeah. sure yeah but you have to stay the course right you have to stay the course there is definitely some determination in there yeah because yeah so so as you kind of look forward obviously health to you and your family extremely important and and you're gonna stay healthy and fit so what are, what are your objectives my objectives yeah from a and you know as a business person well i would like to grow my business right but like i said you know there it's so hard to find people to to step in and and help um you know it's hard to find carpenters really yeah um there's lots of young people who want to work i have two great employees right now um they're both one's a first one's a second year apprentice the other one is currently in school in uh college of caledonia right taking his first year but um ultimately i would like to grow and um i'm just waiting for that to come so would that be then in uh, where you do renovations primarily uh, I look at this uh, what you did this is a hobby like this and my uh, I'm building I'm currently building a canoe and um, you know these are I, I enjoy woodworking I, I think um, it goes hand in hand and like there's just so many aspects of the this carpentry is, trade that this makes you an artist yeah, and that's what I like about the woodworking. Like, yeah. I'm unsure if you've seen my canoe I'm building or not, no, but no. Uh, I'm building a canoe right now, and um, it's it's rather a nice canoe. But. Yeah. So, did you want to have a canoe, or was it the challenge of building it yourself? Well, it all started probably 20 years ago. I I was working with this. Uh, I was an apprentice, and I was working with this carpenter. And the carpenter was teaching me how to build stairs in a high-rise building. And um, the whole idea was, is this man is going to teach me how to build stairs. I'm going to take over. He's going to retire. And I remember right. him talking about building a canoe. And I was like, a canoe? That's really neat. So I always wanted to do what he did, was to build a canoe. And, right. But finding the space and the time. And, yeah. But yeah, I'm building a, uh, a canoe out of Western Red Cedar. Um, and it is done with uh there is walnut and um 
um, walnut and ash inlays in the sides. It's called a Wabnaki. It's a 16 foot Wabnaki. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and then you going to use it uh, or? I'm going to use it. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm probably going to go to Alberta, um, you know, in the Rockies here somewhere, get some pictures of it. And then I'm probably going to take it down the Crooked River and yeah. catch some fish. Where is Crooked River? It's north of here a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Two words. So, uh, so most of your work that you're doing now is in the region here close by, right? Yeah, we have a, a big job out at Nuco Lake. We're doing a, uh, a log cabin out there. It's a full reno, um, kitchen, bedrooms, baths, laundries. Um, we have an exterior renovation happening in, in town here. It's a full exterior one. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a bunch in the, in the making for sure. Yeah. And, and so if, if you talk about exterior, what are you talking about? Painting it or? Um, no, all new siding. Um, windows are getting bigger. Uh, gen, a giant composite deck with big staircases, um, door changes. Um, just the whole exterior is going to look brand new again. Yeah. yeah. So, that, uh, so that alone is a challenge. Uh, you know, you have a pretty good taste of what it should be looking like. Yeah, so if I had sure. to come to my house and say, okay, Will, what do I do here? Is that kind of how it would go? Is saying, so here's my house, Will, what do I have to do yeah, like, to rejuvenate it? Like I work with designers on some of these things. So yeah. like, like ultimately, I don't really know what the homeowner wants. Right. And in if, Neither does he likely. Yeah. And if, and if they have an idea, then I work with them to make that idea come to life. Right. Um, but if they are kind of don't have the idea of what they want, it's nice to get a designer involved. Yeah. Um, I'm working with a local designer on both the exterior one and um, also on the log home with a different designer. Yeah, yeah, good, good. And, and so, but the challenge always is that, as you said, your phone keeps ringing because obviously you've built now yes. a very knowledgeable reputation. Yeah. Like a like a bathroom is, you know, four weeks on average to get a bathroom in five maybe and like you can only pick up so many of those or a kitchen is however long so right you can't answer everybody's phone call no. and, and there's there's a lot of people here in prince george who want things done and yeah you know well you know it, prince george is still a growing town although mm -hmm. uh, we are kind of dormant in a way on growth i think we still around the eighty thousand. Yeah, people here, and in spite of the a uh, lot of sawmills have shut down, but still there is a lot of business happening. There's a lot of yeah, still for more sure. growth, right? There is, yeah, yep. And and especially in the region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been I've been very fortunate. Like when I moved to Prince George, like I had a reputation in Vancouver. I knew a lot of people, a lot of contractors, a lot of carpenters, a lot of people. And I had a pretty good name built in such a big area. And then I moved here and I didn't know anybody. Like there was nobody here that I knew. Why, so, why did you make the decision to come to Ben George? Well, I used, I, I lived in Vancouver and we, and uh, I remember taking a job up in Fort Nelson, BC. Okay. And I would travel back that and forth. That is way up north. It's way up there. Yeah. It's even another it's way 500 miles further north. Yeah. yeah. I loved it there. But yeah. I went up there to make all the money that you keep hearing, but it really wasn't that great um, no. of the money making thing. So I would stop by here on the way and I had a friend here and uh, I kind of like Prince George because it's a lot like where I grew up. Yeah. People actually call it the sister city of yeah. where I grew up. Oh my. Yeah. So, um, so the reason I moved here mainly is because when we were in Vancouver, we had kids and it was like the traffic is just crazy because I would yeah. go from maple ridge to north vancouver back and forth two to four hours a day oh my god and then after having kids it was like now we have to sit in the lineups for the schools and to me i just i just didn't want to be a part of of yeah. all this extra work what a way to live yeah and i really wanted my kids to grow up with the lifestyle i had yeah and this city is very much like the lifestyle i had yeah, it didn't used to be that way. I when I came here in 1965, July 1965, mm -hmm. it was a boom town. So the question right. was usually, 
when did you get in and when are you leaving? Yeah, just to make much money. like Fort Nelson when I went there. Exactly like yes. that. And uh, obviously now it has become, uh, you know, and that's what I say to a lot of people and the people watching this show is that mm -hmm. Penn Stewart's is a perfect, perfect family city. It's still not too big, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it has all the things you can it is. even wish for. Colleges, good schools, colleges, University of Northern British Columbia, the most highest ranked yeah. small universities in Canada for many years. Yep. It's right here. And I feel like people still think it's a town here, but it's like a yeah. city. It's 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 a it's a it's a well sized city. Like it's a good sized place to live. Yeah. And uh, it's half the reason I picked the name Urban in my company name is yeah. because it's not really a town. It's no. we're it's growing here. Yeah. And it's a beautiful place. It's great opportunities here for entrepreneurship. We have yeah. a great university, um, yeah. hospital. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And cancer clinic. Yeah. You know, and, and then uh, we have an, uh, a university where the medical side of the university mm -hmm. is growing and expanding. Yeah. So it's, uh, it has changed a lot. It, I'm sure it has, yeah. So that kind of looking at it, uh, you know, from hobbies. But uh, now you're a very busy, busy guy because of all the things that I'm you do. I'm a very do. busy guy, absolutely. Yeah. So what do you do for hobbies? So what are your hobbies? I like the outdoors. Yeah. Um, I, I love my fly fishing. Good, good choice to be in pin shorts. Exactly. Like I grew up fly fishing and, um, and I love it. So yeah. that's one of my things, like the woodworking and the fly yeah. fishing. It, 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 that's, my, that's my thing for That's sure. what you like to do. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have the shop at home then? Or? Yeah, I have a shop at home. Out, yeah, yeah. A detached shop. Yeah. yeah. So the... Uh, yeah, it's uh, you know it's an amazing, amazing town here. It in, is. It's in, a it's a wonderful place. I I seen I seen opportunity when when I was choosing a place to move, because Vancouver's getting very busy. So to me, I we had to go. Like it was it was very busy there. And and Vancouver is even now getting busier and busier, busier and, and busier. busier. But I'm very grateful because I worked with some of the best, and I've learned. I've learned so much there that I don't know if I would have learned anywhere else. Right. And like uh, the beautiful thing of working at all these different businesses is problem solving. Like, right. you know, if you're stuck in one trade, it's just easier to problem solve if you're a part of all these different types of carpentry yeah. from woodworking to form work, to residential, to right. movies, to marine and boiled, yeah. like doing ships and like, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's a, it's a great, it was a great place to do my apprenticeship. Yes. Are, are you very active on social media at all? Or, uh? I, I am. I love, so I love being on there and doing, and doing my social media. It, it, it was at a point where it was showcasing my work. And now yeah. I feel as though it's just, I'm having fun on there. And it's not so much about showcasing my work anymore. It's more of a, it's more about just having fun and, and... So you don't do it for the basis of attracting clients? Not, yeah, not anymore, not really. I no, mean, like... You're you know, past that level. Like, I built up such a great clientele. Like, yeah. I, have a, I have an amazing client list and I'm very fortunate right. that I've connected with the people I've connected with. Yeah. And... Um, well, you built that reputation, uh, Will. I, I think I built a very good reputation. Yeah, and that's the key. I go to every job and I go above and beyond on every yeah. job. Anything else that comes to mind uh, that you want to add to our podcast and or questions that you have of me potentially? Um, no, uh, not so much. Um. Feel free, <laughs> uh, you know. You see, the, the <laughs> thing that I like about the podcasting and the way I do them is I make them interactive so that, yes. uh, yeah. you know, that uh, you feel, uh, you know, saying, uh, you know, why this or why that or uh, what you feel free to uh, ask me or uh, mm -hmm. you know what so. made you come to Canada when you were that's a good question actually is that uh, I was born November the 1st 1940 and it was at the beginning of the war of the war yeah. uh, the war already had begun uh, my dad uh, mom and dad were married and uh, 1938 mm -hmm. deeply in love the couple they had a, a, a boy and then a girl the year later and then 
when my dad was drafted into the Dutch army, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, you know, then uh, he ended up in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. My mother was pregnant with me, and so uh, Rotterdam was bombed during the Second World War, and they didn't know if he was dead or alive. And so, uh, so there were just the three kids and my mom that went through the war. It was very, very difficult. I still remember the, all the hundreds of planes, bombers in the air, uh, and we were about 15 minutes from the German border. So I still remember the border. And then uh, at nights in particular, my mom, we would go outside on the deck behind our house, not to just look, she felt safer there. And in the distance we could see uh, the cities that were being bombed, already they had infrastructure that was building uh, machinery for the war. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then I remember we were liberated uh, April the 12th, 1945, and, uh, wow. uh, and by the Canadians. And uh, I always knew from that point forward, uh, uh, it was the hunger winter, 1944-45. Mm -hmm. I still, even now, still feel the feeling of hunger and it was the, the coldest winter on record. I still feel the cold and the anxiety from losing potentially my mom, uh, you know, because that was the only one that we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody around us had their own issues. Do you and feel that, as though your ADHD may have came from that trauma in your life? Or? Yeah, that's a good question, Will. I don't think so. I think I always would have been ADHD. Me too. And, and, and so some people uh, have asked me about that, uh, and, uh, and I believe uh, firmly that's, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Although I'm still affected by PTSD, there's no question about that. Absolutely. And I'm still affected by the inner child, that little boy that uh, had the fear of losing uh, his mom, or the only protector that we had, mm -hmm. uh, always stayed me. I got counseling for that actually well into my 50s. You know, right. very emotional, you know, so, uh, but uh, yeah, good observation. But so from that point forward, I knew I would go to the land of my heroes. And uh, I tried to go when I was 17. Uh, I was drafted into the Dutch Air Force for two years, Special Forces actually, don't awesome. know why. And, uh, you know, and then worked in the lumber industry there in Holland. And then... Uh, came to Canada in, uh, in July of 1965. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, with the idea, I always kind of bothered me that uh, uh, the friends that I had, kids are hard on each other, right? So in grade seven, they went to college and university, and I became a laborer. I'm proud of that today. Absolutely. But then I was yep. kind of looked down on a little bit. And uh, so, but I always knew I wanted to build my own lumber mill, and uh, I was gonna start with nothing. Mm -hmm. Other than the suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, came out the best here at 25, 47. Couldn't speak the language, didn't know yep. anybody, didn't have a job. Times were different, but I had about $400 and a backpack when yeah. I came to Vancouver. And, and there you go, right? Yeah. So, and, but it's attitude, passion, work ethic, mm -hmm. and that obviously is part of you as well. 100%, yeah. And, and so, uh, so from there and then, there was no question that... If I ever would go back to Holland, I'd be either successful or in the box, and uh, in my mind. And <laughs> mm -hmm. so it just, uh, in a very short order, within a year, I was a superintendent of one of the largest mills here. Then I got an ownership in a sawmill in Watson Lake, Yukon, and, uh, and, and gave it all away again, owned a motel there, gave it all away again, started all over again here in July, uh, of 1975 was bringing force products and then from there and then uh, uh, was nothing really and uh, it grew and uh, so today we are a pretty fair sized medium sized company mm -hmm. nice yeah you've, you've made a name for yourself for sure which is great well to, to me what is important it's not about how successful john is it's not about that is uh, you know going through all the ups and downs along the way, absolutely, and then giving back to the community to mm -hmm. me has always been important. For sure. Hence the college. Uh, I've always been of university, and I'm always been involved in the community. And then uh, I'm a fairly active speaker, working mm -hmm. with young people in particular. Yep. And uh, I would say everything is possible.
Mm -hmm. You know, and then ADHD to me has become something that I've been very vocal about it, and obviously with my books. Yeah, for sure. Like, that's one of the things that grasped my attention toward your Instagram was your your talk on ADHD. Because when I was younger, it was more of a bad thing, it seemed. You know, like it would get you in stigma. trouble. It was a stigma to it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, um, yeah, it, it's good to see that... Uh, you know, people have learned about it, and it's more acknowledged now. And well, that's sure. what I feel. You know, it's it's very in, important to. It's it's an, not a liability to me. It's an asset. Uh, you know, so if I write Bill, is that one L? Two L's, yeah. Yeah, all the best. So I'm going to just while we're sitting here talking, and sign the books for you. And that's uh, amazing. So the. Yeah, then with the, the last thing that I, a lot of people said to me over the years, you know, that, you know, you, you've been, it's such an interesting life, you should write a book about it. And, and saying, well, writing books is not easy. And, uh, you know, so I tried it for many years, you know, and, and as I said, with, uh, against all odds, uh, you know, that I thought about it for, uh, I lived it for 80 years. And I thought about it for 20, and then when, if I didn't do it now, five years, six years ago, then it's going to be too late and there will be no book. So I thought I may as well start it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it took me two years. And then, against all odds, you can't write an autobiography and say, mm, I don't like it, I'll do another one. No, you get one crack at it. You <laughs> and so, uh, so it has, it, I, I like it. And then, I'm writing this other one, the fourth one, uh, you know, and uh, that will come out in July, August. And then I'm working on another one following that, so that... Uh, That's amazing. Yeah, so, so I like it now, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm sure the more you do, the, the better you're getting at it and, and easier it's becoming, for sure. It, it becomes a bit of a process, you know, so mm -hmm. that you get used to and... Uh, and it's special. Yeah. No. I'm well, just, thank you so much for having thank me you. on here. It was I'm very humble it. to meet you for sure. Yeah. In uh, in Absolutely. mutual. Uh, here are my books, and awesome. uh, I'll get you another copy of this one once That's it comes amazing. out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Alrighty.